again, not a, a horrible uh, stream, but this section is return oriented shellcode. As I mentioned, I tried to do this a few weeks ago, but there were some technical errors and the audio wasn't there. So I killed that. This is an excerpt from a retired content from my SANSEC 760 course. I ha asked at the very beginning when I started this stream back in September, 2022, I, I started with a use after free retired section um, from 760 on browser-based exploitation. And I said to folks out on Twitter, I, would you wanna see this? Like, even though it's a bit old now because we're talking about Internet Explorer 11 or whatever it was, would, would you still wanna see that? And I think it is in fact still very valuable um, even if the operating system or the browser version is a bit dated, the way in which you go and exploit those types of vulnerabilities are still the same. So I just asked the community, would you want to see that? People said yes, enough people. So I, I said, okay, let's do it. And that, you know, that that video's gotten around 10,000 streams, I think, so far. So which is which is pretty neat. Um, this is the same thing. This is content that can you still do return oriented shellcode? Yes, absolutely. Um, the reason I pulled it out, as I mentioned, is because it was a 32-bit proof of concept application. It was just there to explain the technique that is return-oriented shellcode, and that's what I'll I'll do. But note that this is retired content from 760. This is also a 32-bit app, but that doesn't really make a difference. It's just a, a shorter address, right? Um, most of the application moving to cloud, not a mitigation is cloud operating system. Yeah, I mean, people are still going to be using their laptops and desktops and phones to connect, though. So we still have the endpoint, even if you're using the cloud applications. I mean, for the most part, we're exploiting browsers and uh, applications like word processing viewers, Adobe Reader and Nitro PDF and all those types of things where we can view documents. So as long as we can exploit file format vulnerabilities or protocol parsing or uh, file parsing vulnerabilities on the endpoint applications that should still be good to go. But yeah, for sure, there's stuff in the cloud, different types of vulnerabilities are gonna be focusing there. That's why I'm gonna have Corey Ball on in a couple of weeks to uh, walk us through some API testing stuff on, on the web. So if you don't know Corey, he came out with a, a great hacking APIs book and I thought it'd be good to have him on. So we chatted and he'll be on, I think uh, at the end of March, the end of the month here. I'm going to Singapore next, late next week, so I won't be doing a stream. I'm going to try and pre-record something and post it up so it debuts at that time, but I'll be in Singapore and Bangkok, Thailand for about 12 days. So at once I get back, I've got Corey coming on, then I've also got Jason Ostrom, who I first met Jason when he, or not, I didn't meet him. We used one of his tools, Voip Hopper, in SANSEC 760, or 660 course, and then years later, he came up and did some talks at SANS and um, knew Ed Skoda, some other folks, and he came on and, and started presenting uh, as a SANS instructor, working to become a certified instructor, and now he's a certified instructor, and he's came out with a great tool recently on called Purple Cloud, and I'm going to have him come on and speak to that, because a lot of us aren't very good at Terraform and things like that to do provisioning in the cloud, so we can do, like, adversary emulation or whatever it is we want to practice, and he wrote this fantastic tool that pretty much does everything for you which, you know, that's not always the way we want things to go. We do like to understand how things work under the hood, but if someone builds a great tool like that, why not take advantage of it and understand it? All right, so um, let's walk through a couple slides here. So what we're gonna do is, so why would we do a return oriented shellcode? Because maybe the buffer's too small to hold our shellcode. Maybe we just don't have a way of getting our payload into the process that we're compromising. Maybe that we, maybe we have um, only control of the instruction pointer and that, that's, that's all we can do. So we can redirect the flow of execution, but we can't do any more than that. We can't execute a payload, but we can execute a ROP chain. So the idea here is instead of using ROP to try and change permissions in memory to be able to execute our payload, since there is no payload, let's just mimic our shell code with gadgets. So we want to string together a bunch of pointers to code sequences that mimic that of something like an exec VE shellcode. That's our goal. So think of what shellcode is. It's just we, we write it in assembly and we assemble it into machine code or opcodes. We're using ROP to find those opcodes in order that mimics what our shellcode would normally do. Now, this would be very challenging to do something like mimicking meterpreter like you're not going to do that but when it comes to like basic payload execution you can certainly string together the code sequences to do something like that and you can get as complex as you want it's just going to be very time consuming to do something 
that's requires hundreds and hundreds of lines of code to execute. Oh, Elwood, yeah, it's cool. Peter, I just talked to Peter Venicott last week. It's it's awful. He's he just got back from Singapore. He was there last week. I'm going to Singapore next week, and like we barely cross paths. It's happened many times in the past, but Peter and I are good friends. He's a he's a great guy. You'll you'll enjoy his class for sure. So um, we're gonna go with the goal of executing exec ve uh, system call and we just want to figure out some way to pop a shell on the compromised system and i first learned about this technique when i was reading through an old paper hook from Havav shashim and i think it was stephen checkaway on like hacking voting machines and how they were able to use return oriented shell code due to the limitation of being able to get your payload into the target if you understand what the binary looks like you can string things together so what we need to do is ensure that the accumulator register holds the system call number we want to call and of course on linux the syscall table is static both on 32 and 64 bit so as long as we notice the syscall number we load that into the accumulator register and then depending on if it's a 32 or 64 bit application or process we need to make sure we get the appropriate arguments into the right registers there are other things we have to compensate for as well we have to make sure things like the count register needs to point to the argument vector array the data register needs to point to the environmental pointer array, but we can hack it a bit. We can make it point to like a pointer to a pointer to our string, or we can make it point to a null D word or quad word to get around some of these dependencies. Usually when I've ever written shell code from scratch, if I wasn't able to do it with Venom, MSF Venom or Payload, I would figure out what system calls I wanna make. I'd write a little C program that makes those system calls, and then I'd, debug it. I'd set a breakpoint on the system call and I'd look at the stack and everything and see how the arguments and all need to be set up versus, you know, on the stack or on the registers. And then you would mimic that in your, your shell code. And as with everything else, get it working. And then once you get it working, you should be good to go against the target process. But these are just some of the requirements. Specifically, again, this is going to be a simple example because when you're doing something in a class, you want to focus on the technique at hand. Like, I don't want to be distracted when I'm trying to teach something like a specific technique that is return oriented shell code by things like data execution prevention. We're going to avoid that by executing in the code segment. So we're not dealing with payloads or permissions issues. ASLR, so randomization, if it's on a target system, yeah, we would have to either figure out a way to remain position independent by capturing the stack pointer at the moment in time when code execution is initiated. And then we'd have to write to relative offsets from the stack pointer from that preserve value so we can remain relative and position independent. So the one thing that ASLR will cause us pain on is knowing where the base address is of a, my, a module or a library. And obviously some things are statically mapped like in the example I'm gonna show you here I wrote a little program to use mmap to statically map this library into memory. And that's going to be how we know where things are. Now, if we didn't have that, we would have to get a memory leak. And I'm, I'm going to do a another session when it's just me coming up in the future on another browser you used to have to free exploit that was a true memory leak. So we were able to leak out the base address of various DLLs by subtracting the relative address of what was leaked to get the base address. And then from there, we can write to the relative offsets within that module where the ROP gadgets are located. So I'm gonna do one on the future in that to talk specifically about memory leaks and how you would exploit them and leverage them. But in this case here, we're gonna be dealing with the statically mapped module so we can focus on what we're looking at, which is return oriented shell code. So we specifically need those gadgets on the screen. What we want to do is call exec ve. So the first thing we need to do, zero out the accumulator register. Then we need a pop pop ret, and then we need some other stuff. I've got an image coming up on the next slide that's going to explain to you why we need these gadgets. The one that's interesting, though, is this one right here. Let's switch this. This one right here, this gadget that says move, EA, and this is at and syntax. I know it's horrible, but move EAX into this offset from EDX. Why, why this offset? What do we move? What we're going to end up moving is we're going to be writing a double word of null bytes to a specific location on the stack. And it just so happens that we were able to find a 
ROP gadget that writes to offset 24 decimal or hex 18 from the DX register. And you'll see why we need to do this on the next slide. This one ends up being the confusing gadget for people though, after having taught this for a few years. And then we've got some other gadgets down here. So I'm gonna walk through all these gadgets and why we need them on the next slide here. Yeah, we're breaking our shell code into sequences and placing them. Yeah, so exactly, gadgets are short sequences of code that we string together via pointers to achieve some overall objective. So we're just stringing together short chunks of what our shell code would, would have done in succession, but we've parsed through memory to find you know, snippets of the shell code that we can string together to mimic what the shell code or payload execution would have done. So this slide here is, um, this one's a, a, a painful one to write. I remember when I wrote this and made this slide, like trying to make it so you can visualize what's going on with this attack technique is challenging. So let me walk you through this. Starting on the left, this is our vulnerable buffer. So just pretend it's a stack overflow and we were able to overwrite the return pointer. So gadget number one is a pointer where we're overwriting the return pointer with the address of a code sequence that zeros out the accumulator register and then returns. Because remember, when we return to gadget number one, the stack pointer is automatically gonna advance forward to the next pointer on the stack. So we'll XOR the accumulator register to zero it out, and then we're gonna return to gadget number two. Gadget number two says pop, pop, ret. I know some of you are thinking, oh, isn't that the technique we did in uh, Windows SEH overrides? Yes, but this is different. We're gonna pop into ECX the value 0B, 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 0B. Now, the reason we care about 0B is because that is the syscall number 11, which is for exec VE. So we only care about the lowest byte. So if you wanted to put 0, 01, 0, 02, 0, 03, 0, 0B, that's fine. But that last byte needs to be 0B. Later on, you're gonna see this OR instruction down there that's gonna OR the CL from one register into the accumulator register for the syscall. So that's why we're popping zero Bs into ECX. Then we're popping into EDX, the address of the null position on the stack, which is over here, minus 24 bytes. So this is the confusing one. Just know that over here on the far right, we need a double word of null bytes there. Why? Because we're going to use it as a pointer for our environmental pointer array. We're just going to point to null. So we just need a double word of null on the stack somewhere. And if we knew it was somewhere else, that's totally fine. But here's what we're trying to do right now. We know that there's going to be a null at this offset from the point when we overwrite the return pointer. Remember, this is our buffer. We're controlling the buffer and all the data that's going into it. So we know the offsets accordingly where we need this null position to be on the stack, what we need to pop into the EDX register is the address of this null double word minus 24 bytes. So two things, how do we know the address? Because the stack in this case is going to be static. If it weren't, we'd have to not get a leak, we would just have to record the address of the stack pointer at the very beginning to make sure we understand the offsets accordingly but I'm trying to just simplify it here. So what we need to do is pop into EDX, the address of this null double word in memory, minus 24 or 18 hex. Why minus 24? Because this next gadget here, gadget number three, is gonna write the double word of null bytes to the EDX register plus 24. Now, if we found a gadget that said, just move the double word from the EAX register into EDX, great. Into the address EDX points to, great. But we only found a gadget, as you'll see in our case, that writes to what's in EDX plus 24 bytes. That's why we had to pop into EDX, the address of the null, minus 24. So it writes to the address plus 24. So if you wanna simplify, just know that we need to get this double word of null on the stack to this specific spot. And so we need to calculate the addressing accordingly. After that, we return to gadget number three, which does the writing, return to gadget number four, which ORs AL with CL. 
that takes the zero B in the low byte of the count register and puts it into EAX. So EAX will now be 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0B. 0B is the system call number for exec VE. Then we return to gadget number five, which pops into EBX the address of our string that we want exec VE to execute. So we're simply popping into EBX the address of our argument that we want exec VE to execute. How do we how do we know that? Because when you look at the syscall number 11 for exec VE, it tells you which register needs to hold which arguments. So we need it to have a string. Sometimes we're compensating for things like, again, the argument vector and the environmental pointer. But in this case, it's just the register that needs to hold the argument, which is the string for exec VE to execute. So we give it the address of our string on the stack. Our next gadget is another pop pop rep. We're popping into ECX a pointer to our argument vector, which is a pointer to the string. So pointer to pointer. Remember, think of argv, argc, right? That's what we're compensating for. Then we pop into EDX the address of the null byte on the stack. So we just need to make sure that EDX holds the null byte on the stack, the address of that. After that, we're pretty much done. We just do an interrupt 8.0, which is the old style of a system call instead of going through the Linux gate or some other technique. Now, what I end up executing here, this string, is simply a string to a little script that I'll show you in a moment that pops a root shell if it's executed by a privileged set UID program. But that is, in short, the gadgets that we need to set up. The easiest way to do this would be to obviously try it yourself after you see me demonstrate it. I'll try to remember to put um, the code. I can grab the vulnerable program and put it up somewhere online so that you can download it and try it yourself if you want. This right here is our part of our script. Now you can see what I have are the addresses of all the gadgets once we've figured out what they are, what they're supposed to be. Like here you see the zero Bs that will get popped into ECX. And then below that, we need to figure out what the address of the null byte minus 24 is going to be. So in order to do that, we'd have to debug the process and get the stack address if it's static. Now, if it's not a static stack, then what you'd have to do with the very first gadget would be to preserve the stack pointer at that moment in time, and then to calculate via relative offsets. It's just gonna take a lot more work to get it to, to work, but it, it does work. It's just more time consuming. And again, I just wanna focus on the problem at hand, which is our technique at hand, which is how do we do this return oriented shellcode technique? So I'm gonna jump over to this system, this Ubuntu box, it's got the vulnerable application on it. And, uh, it's not that, what is it called, S code? No, I forget what it's called, oh yeah, so CD into sec 760 rop, is it in here? Yeah, there we go. So if I run this program, it says usage, it wants the program name and then a file to open. So if we just say something like touch T and then echo hello into T, and then we run the program. It says file contents, hello. So not very exciting, a little POC program. Now it's got a, it's got a buffer overflow vulnerability. That's not the purpose of this stream, but we do need a vehicle to, that allows us to get control of the instruction pointer. So we do need to figure out the buffer overflow real quick. So let's do that through reversing. Should take us a couple seconds. So we say GDB, into the program, we do an ls, what am I doing, ls, haha, <laughs> disassemble, main. Down here, you can see that there are some calls. There's a call to static stack, which maps the static stack. There's a call to map the libc, which is gonna use mmap to map the uh, library that we're going to find gadgets in. You see a call to a function called move. So if we say info functions, this should show us everything we need to know. So here's a function called overflow. Let's take a look at that one. So when we look at the overflow function, you can see there's a call to stir copy. So clearly we know where the buffer overflow is. And now we need to know what the buffer size is. The buffer size is right here. You can always count on an instruction like this or similar to tell you the buffer size when we're dealing with the stack overflow. 
where it's saying load the effective address of the base pointer minus hex 40 into the accumulator register and then write the accumulator register to the top of the stack call stir copy and that's its destination argument so we're telling it to write at negative hex 40 from the base pointer so that's your buffer size 16 times 4. so we're dealing with the 64 byte buffer and then we've got four more bytes for the save frame pointer so 68 bytes plus four more bytes should result in the crash so let's validate this we'll say shell and now I'm going to say Python minus C print A times 68 plus B, 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 B. And then we're going to pipe that into T. Now we're back in the debugger. So if I say run T, if we get 42424242 on the instruction pointer, we know that our calculation was right of the buffer size. And here you can see. We got it, 42424242. So buffer size, good. But th the only reason we care about this was we need to get to the point where we can now overwrite the return pointer with the very first gadget that we need. So the next thing we need to know is what addresses or what library or module is statically mapped if we don't have an ASLR leak or memory leak to bypass ASLR so that we can choose that module for finding ROP gadgets. So I'm going to drop out completely here and we're going to run L trace against it. And I'm just going to say, um, we'll just put the T in there. It's fine. And see what we get. So seg fault occurred. Great. What I care about here is this. There's this opening of this library called libply1337 leap dot shared object dot whatever and it's being m mapped to this address here so if you remember there was a call to a function that was called map the libc i think it was and if you were to go and set a breakpoint on main and run the process and then start looking for the rop gadgets they're not going to be there because that memory has not been mapped yet you have to make sure you set a breakpoint at a time after this call to m map has occurred before you'll be able to validate that those gadgets that you find do exist in memory. So just something to keep in mind. But this load address is something that we would need. 030A would be the load address and then offsets from there. So what we would need to do is grab this module here and use a ROP gadget tool to help us find usable gadgets. So I'm gonna use this ROP gadget tool called Rope Me, which stands for Return Oriented Programming Exploitation Made Easy. It was written by Long Lee. And it's not a great tool, but it's one that I happen to have on here. So I'm going to use this thing called ROP Shell. And it says Simple ROP Interactive Shell Generate Load Search Gadgets. So I'm actually going to drop out. I need to copy the library that we want to scan through for ROP gadgets. I'm going to copy it to this location. So copy that to here so you can see now i've got a copy of that library so i'm going to grab that and now we're going to go back in and we're going to say generate gadgets from this file so it says generated 828 gadgets what's the gadget tool doing all it's doing is simply a, a simple one all it's doing is looking through memory for the C3 opcode, if you're talking about x86, because C3 is a return. And then it iterates backwards based on a depth that you set, one byte, two bytes, three bytes, four bytes, and it checks to see if whatever code sequence in, starts at that position, if it terminates with a return instruction, then, then great, we can use it, that's a usable gadget. Not everything's gonna be a usable gadget when you find a C3 opcode because Sometimes it's going to be seen as part of another code sequence, another opcode or instruction. But that's simply all it's doing. It parses through memory, looking for C3 bytes, iterating backwards to see if it ends with that being a return instruction. So this found 828, dumping to a file called this with a GGT for gadget extension. Now we're going to say load. We can load those gadgets. So load, paste that in. And now you can see it loaded the 828 gadgets and we can then search. So I'm going to type in search 
So it gives me the syntax. Now this is a weird syntax. You can see as an example, like search for the instruction and then something like this, pointer EAX, or does that mean pointer? Is this at and It's like, it's not very, not a very attractive um, search syntax. Yeah, <laughs> um, just laughing at your comment, Elwood. So I'm gonna say something like the first gadget we need was an XOR EAX, EAX, right? So we'll say search XOR EAX, and I'll just end it with a percent sign. And here you can see at this address, there's an XOR EAX, EAX, followed by a return. So that should be a usable one. If, if we wanna validate this, we could grab these addresses, and then we need to add it to the load address of the mmapped module. Then we can validate that those things are there. But when you look at this script here, uh, where did it go? I thought I had it. I'm just looking for something real quick. So first off, this S code one dot C is simply a little program that takes the shell code that you put up here and does this little funky magic at, at runtime where it converts S code into a function and executes it. So that's what this code is doing right here. It turns S code into a function and executes what's there. So if we actually were to run this as a regular user, you can see it just gives us a regular user shell. But if we run it with a privileged program like this one, so if we do a ls minus la, you could see it's a set UID owned by root process. Another example of that, of course, would be like, how do you change your password? You use the password command. Well, password itself, if we do ls minus la, is owned by root and the set UID bit is set because in order for password program to work, it needs to be able to access Etsy shadow to modify your credentials or your, your hash. So you would need to find a program like that that is set UID bit enabled owned by a privileged user. If there's a vulnerability in that program, then you'd be able to elevate your privileges. So what we wanna do is get this 760 ROP program to execute the S code program for us to elevate our privileges. And if we can get that to work, then we would we would win. So if I go into the solution folder, oh weird, I don't know where the um, where the actual Python script went. That's too bad. The Python script, if I go back out here, it, this is a snippet of it. And basically what's gonna be in there are all these populated addresses you, you saw me just search for the xor eax eax gadget and then these addresses here are also going to be calculated because in order to get them we simply need to look at the stack at the moment in time where we get control and populate those addresses so let's take a look at validating the address of those gadgets. So here we could see it said there's XOR EAX gadget. So let's go and set a breakpoint up in the process to validate that. So we'll say GDB 760 ROP again, and then disassemble overflow. I'm going to set a breakpoint right here on this return. The program's not a position independent executable. So we'll just say break on that address. And we'll say run T. So now we hit the breakpoint, and if I say examine the instruction pointer, we're about to return. Return to what? About to return to four two four two four two four two. Okay, well that's not going to be any good. So what I need to do is change this so that we are returning to that gadget address. Now first, let me get that load address. Actually, I don't need to do that because we can we can do that afterwards. Let me just go back in then. Set that breakpoint up again, and then run T. Okay, great. So we are at the return instruction, and we're about to return to four two four two four two four two. Now, what I want to do is validate that the gadget is at the address where it said it was. 
So let's look at 3F14. 3F14. Well, that's got to be that's got to be added to the M mapped address that we're interested in. So if I say shell L trace sec 760 ROP T like that, and it runs it, we can find the load address 03030A. So 030A. So x slash 2i. 0x030a, and then we're going to add on the offset. So 3f14, let's try that one. 3f14. And there you can see an XOR EAX EAX return. So that matches up. So all we did was take the load address and added this offset. And then there's another one above it, 83a0. So 83a0. And there's an XOR EAX EAX, but it follows with the repeat till zero return. So it's a little bit different, right? So you have to go and validate which gadgets are gonna work or not work. And that's all we're doing. We're going back and forth between using rope me and validating that the gadgets are there. The only other thing we need to do is now that we're at the point where we'd, we would be overriding the return pointer and, and, and returning to it, we'd have to look at the stack so that we can get the addressing accordingly. So we'd have to populate this script here where it's read with these appropriate addresses at the offsets. And like I said, if we didn't, if ASLR was on and we didn't have this static stack, we would have to record the stack address at the moment in time where the return pointer is overwritten so that we now have the location and memory where, where we're working. And we would have to write to the offsets accordingly, which is going to take at least twice as many gadgets. So that's pretty much um, the gist of it. And then once you get it done, it goes through and executes what I showed you here and should pop a root shell. So let's see if we get that working here. So I've got this ropsploit output, which is the exploit when the Python script with our exploit code was executed. And we would say, who am I? We're just dead list, sec760 rop, ropsploit. And there you can see we have a regular user shell again, which is interesting. So why do we have a regular user shell? Let's see what's going on here. So we're not supposed to have that. But it did work. You see that it did work, in fact, which is nice. Some, for some reason, privileges got dropped. So sec760 rop, it is root with the set you ID bit set. So I'm not sure why it dropped the privileges. There must be some setting in the operating system that's ignoring the fact that uh, it is a set UID program, set UID program executing this. Let's try running that one just in case it's uh, something wrong with that version. That would be solution. No, I'm still just giving us that. All right, so I'm not sure why it is doing that, but you get the point. Um, that's just supposed to work. Let me show one more thing here real quick, because I want to know if it is a an issue. Yeah, because this right here, it's already actually up on a prior demo. That VM, I think it's just there's some OS setting that's ignoring the fact that that, again, should be working. You can see on this system, that it did work. So if we have ROP shellcode, it's the same thing. And actually now we can see the ROPsploit Python script. So vim ROPsploit.py. There is the same script you saw on the slide, but with the stack addressing populated, where I just showed you, we set the breakpoint on the return and you could see those stack offsets. That's where you would get that information from. And then if we drop out of here, and we do an ls minus la on sec 760 rop you can see the set you set uid bit is set owned by root and we've got the same thing if we run just the program as a regular user we're just a regular user but when we run it out here then we get a root shell and then we're root so i, I don't know what it is on that other vm i'm gonna have to go figure that out as to why it's uh 
not letting us get that root shell, even though it's a set UID enabled program, there must be some other mitigation there that's blocking it. But that is the gist of what I wanted to show. I uh, don't think there's any more slides there. Any questions on that technique before we uh, finish up here? Because that's pretty much all we wanted to do. What was the reason to remove Windows heat from sec 760? Um, that's a good question. So the day five of the course used to be on <clears throat> Windows heaps, but primarily looking at use after free exploitation. The problem was that in order to do a good job at covering the Windows 64-bit heap and having an exercise, that's going to take multiple days on just that topic because we'd have to spend some time understanding the JavaScript engine and Chrome internals. I mean, even the ones that are out there in some courses that I'm aware of, I won't talk about any of them, but they're quite dated. They're years and years old, the examples that they use, because the techniques just aren't as reliable as they used to be. And so the choice had to be made where we either would have to pretty much spend three days of the course looking at nothing but the Windows heap, because things like heap grooming and all, it's very useful. But you need to have like a corresponding exploit to go with it. And, and one of the things I thought of was like, well, we could take DNS SIG Red. We could take the, one of the recent TCP IP vulnerabilities. But we'd have to spend a couple days on the actual exploit itself and discovery of it. And then a couple days on heap grooming to try and get code execution. Uh, the browser stuff would also, like I said, take multiple days because of the internals of Chromium and JavaScript engine. And what we wanted to do in the course was to be able to cover, um, we wanted to be able to cover Windows kernel, patch diffing. We wanted to have a day on Linux exploitation. So we do like tcache poisoning and stuff like that. We wanted to have a day on setting up your build environment and doing flirt and flare and IDA scripting, um, as well as the Windows internals to be able to get us into the heap section and kernel stuff. The kernel section takes about a day and a half, and that's honestly not enough time. That day runs really late as it is. So I think it was just a decision to where, do we wanna keep it a survey course where we can cover quite a few different things, or do we want it to be just a course that focuses very specifically on one or two exploits? And we went with the former versus the latter. So that's pretty much uh, the reason. Yeah, I'll, the code for this, I need to pull it out of the VM and then I'm gonna update the description on YouTube with the links for it. So it's gonna take a few hours for that to happen because the, the video's got a process and then I need to just edit it to get that info up there. But yeah, I'll, I'll put it up there so you can download it. Certification for 760. We were, we were looking at that for a while um, and we actually wrote an exam for it where you were to do a patch diff of a driver and then write a kernel exploit uh, to do to demonstrate you've got a write primitive. Because if you saw a few weeks ago, a couple months ago, when I had Connor McGar on um, that technique of using previous mode to get the write primitive because code execution is really almost impossible in a kernel these days on Windows, uh, that technique got killed. So it's more like one off attacks and stuff. So the the exam, if we were to launch it and continue with it, we weren't able to find anybody who could pass it. But if we were to move forward with it, it's, it would still feel a little bit dated because you're going to be using a technique that if you were on Windows 11 with the most recent version of the kernel um, and HVCI running, it's not going to work. But um, we're still thinking about it. We're still looking at that. Um, So the rise of Rust, yeah, Rust Rust is an important language for going forward. I know, you know, Google's doing their thing with Rust and then Microsoft's been doing a lot of Rust work and I wouldn't be surprised if a new Windows kernel at some point comes out in Rust as more and more components get converted over to it. But um, it's gonna be a while. I mean, Rust isn't gonna take over things overnight. You've got a lot of big apps out there like Adobe Codebase and just Microsoft Office Suite and everything else that's written purely in C++ for the most part. And I don't think that's going anywhere for a while. I think we've gotten to a point now where the mitigations are so strong and there's so many of them that getting around all the mitigations is becoming problematic. But as I said in the beginning, when someone mentioned shadow stacks and control flow enforcement, like for example, if we go over to 
we go over to this uh, Windows 10 system here. Let me find one. Yeah, so this Windows 10 system here, and we bring up Exploit Guard. You're going to see that all the mitigations are off by default. So, and I asked Chompy this as well uh, a few weeks ago when she was on. You know that same question: where where do you see things going? And and I think we both agreed that things are going to be a bit more one-off. That if you go and look at Internet of Things systems or older systems or outdated kernels running in places, Windows Seven, Windows Eight, Windows Ten, running in different places, different processor support for different hardware exploit mitigations like shadow stacks and all like it's going to be a while before that stuff gets moved over and there's always going to be targets out there but if you do want to target the latest version of windows 10 or 11 then yeah your your work's cut out for you i don't think it's going to be these just default global techniques that you can use anymore like you were able to do with overriding a bit in previous mode are flipping these flags here and there. Uh, some of them are gonna be race conditions where you can flip a bit temporarily and you better hope that in between your code execution and when that mitigation does one of its checks that it doesn't catch you, um, but you'll still have an opportunity. I think write primitives are still gonna be possible. I think that I would imagine that the operating system vendors are at a point now where they're like, we've got enough mitigations where I think we feel pretty good about it. I mean, if we look at exploit guard, and we go to program settings, you can see that they're all off by default. This one I turned on, mandatory ASLR, but like they're all off. And down at the very bottom, oh, this isn't even the one I wanted to look at. There's another one. This is a different build number than the one I was expecting to see. But if we go on to like this build, I believe this build has shadow stacks available, but unless the operating system does a check when it turns on to see whether or not the processor can support shadow stacks and control flow enforcement technology and then opts to turn that mitigation on, it's probably not going to do that. So they're not going to turn this stuff on by default anytime soon. I mean, look how long it got them. It took them to turn on DEP by default. That came on in Windows XP Service Pack 2 initially, and it took a few iterations for them to turn it on. And that one's an easy one to turn off. Um, this is almost done here. But yeah, I think web app attacks are going to become more important again. Obviously, all the API testing and stuff, you know, with with Rust, I mean, there's a function, there's an option for unsafe, right? People, just like with uh, C types in Python, people can import modules and enjoy the all the problems of uh, those low-level languages again. So let's bring up Exploit Guard here. I think this one's going to be a bit newer. Eventually it'll come up. There we go. So let's see if this is the newer one. Nope, it's not there. That's weird. Is it on the main menu here? Is it under system settings? Let's see. I don't think it was though. No, unfortunately, these two VMs I just randomly chose, neither of them seem to have the mitigation I was looking for. But yeah, they're there. They're there by default if you take a more a newer a build number of Windows 10 or 11. But yeah, so to finish that up, I, I think it's going to be more one-off attacks where you're just going to need to have to work really hard. You saw with Chompy, like she got the um, denial of service part of that tcpip.sys bug working. And you could probably groom the heap and, and get that to work, but it's going to take some work. Same thing with Sig Red when that came out. It was easy to get control of the instruction pointer, but then actually to know where to point it and to deal with ASLR and 64-bit, it's a lot more challenging, but not impossible. Like if you're paying people a lot of money, that's why those price tags are up to like several million dollars US if you get this stuff working. So all you need is one bug, you can go retire. So, <laughs> But anyway, that's uh, we'll call it at this point. I'm going to see what I can get together for next Friday. Like I said, I'll be out in Singapore, so I won't be doing it live streaming, but I'll try to get something released. And then when I come back, I've got Corey Ball on to do the web uh, API testing stuff. And then the next week, we'll have Jason Ostrom on to look at Purple Cloud uh, and the Terraform he put together to provision some cool systems to be able to do adversary emulation quite easily.
Uh, last questionnaire. Why do we? Why do we? Yeah, Nati, that uh, really hard to jailbreak. The newest one for sure. They've got mitigations running greatly. Uh, why do we insert nine zeros and in extreme ROP and windows? Um, well, the, the nine zero is just the old NOP instruction, the no op instruction. So if you, I, I always like to say it serves as a landing pad if you need to use it. Where I remember when I was growing up, there was old Bugs Bunny cartoons where Bugs Bunny would jump off the top of a building into a, a glass of water and land perfectly in that glass of water. Most of us wouldn't have that precision. I'd rather land on a giant inflatable landing pad, which I consider that to be like a NOP sled. So you fill memory with a bunch of nine zeros as long as you can redirect the flow of execution somewhere into the memory addressing where those that series of not bytes exists, you just slide down and, and execute your shell code. But a lot of things work as not bytes. You know, hexadecimal four one is increment ECX. You could use that just like you'd use nine zeros. It doesn't really do anything harmful. So as long as you mix it up, you should be able to get around you know detection looking for things like not bytes. I would love to get Peter on here. I asked him multiple times now to the point, even last week where I annoy him, he does not like to do virtual presentations and he does not like to teach online. He likes to be in person with people, which I completely understand. Um, so yeah, I haven't been able to convince him, but maybe maybe you guys can nudge him and, and get him to want to come on. He can come in and plug his class and show him show us some cool heap grooming. I would love to have him on. I, I, I miss Peter. So other than that, cool. We will see you soon and have a great weekend. Bye-bye.